Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on photosynthesis. Before you watch this video, make sure you're confident with the material on the basics of animal and plant cells, and also enzymes and how they work and what affects them. I've got videos on both of those things earlier in this playlist. You should also make sure you're familiar and confident with the chemistry content on the rates of reaction uh, and the different factors that affect that. And I've got a video on in my chemistry playlist on that as well. Now, in this video, we are going to quickly recap plant cells and how they work. Then we'll look at photosynthesis, leaves and stomata, the limiting factors of photosynthesis, light intensity and the inverse square law. Then we'll look at the core practical and there are two different versions of it. So we'll look at the version one with algae balls and version two looking at pondweed. So let's start by recapping what we know about plant cells. Now, in terms of the structure of plant cells, there are a number of things that are found in both animal and plant cells. So we've got the cell membrane um, here, which controls what enters and leaves the cell. And then the cytoplasm here, which is where all the chemical reactions take place inside the cell. Next, we have the nucleus, which contains the DNA and it controls the activities of the cell. We have the mitochondria, many of them, uh, where respiration takes place to provide energy for the cell. And then we have ribosomes, lots and lots of ribosomes to make proteins for the cell. So those things are found in both animal and plant cells. But plant cells also have chloroplasts where photosynthesis takes place and, and they contain chlorophyll. We're going to be talking a lot about these chloroplasts. Uh, and photosynthesis later in this video. We've also got cell walls. Now they provide strength and support for the cell. Um, they're made of cellulose, so we've got this cell wall here. Notice the cell wall is around the outside of the cell membrane. Um, that cell wall is providing strength. It also helps to prevent the cell from bursting as it fills with water. And finally, we've got the permanent vacuole this big area in the centre of the cell which stores sap and it helps to support the cell um, as it fills with water it pushes out against the cell wall a bit like the way the air in a tyre pushes out and supports it. Now photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is an endothermic chemical reaction that uses the energy from light to convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. Now, just this word endothermic, because that might have thrown some of you, an endothermic chemical reaction is one that absorbs energy. So some chemical reactions, like burning, they release energy and they will just keep themselves going. But an endothermic reaction, like photosynthesis, needs energy to drive it. And in this case, the energy that drives it is light, normally from the sun, but also from artificial lights if we're growing things inside. Now. Here's our equation for photosynthesis. So we've got carbon dioxide and water makes glucose and oxygen. You only need to memorize the word equation. We're not going to even bother looking at the symbol equation. Now, photosynthesis takes place in structures in plant cells called chloroplasts, and they contain a green pigment called chlorophyll, which is what traps the energy in the light. The reason that we can't photosynthesize ourselves is because we don't have chloroplasts and we don't have this chlorophyll to trap the energy to drive that chemical reaction. Now, photosynthesis is one of, if not the most important chemical reaction uh, in the world um, because it is the ultimate source of all, virtually all the food we eat and therefore all biomass. Um, biomass is the mass of all the living matter living in an area. So all of you has come from the food that you eat and the water and, and, and the drinks that you drink. And all of that has come ultimately from plants. Even if you've eaten some meat, the meat or the animals have eaten plants themselves. So this photosynthesis is super important. Without it, none of us, plant or animal, would be here. So we're going to spend a bit of time now looking at leaves. Um, Leaves are super important to plants because they are where most photosynthesis happens. And so they've got lots of adaptations, lots of features that enable them to maximise the rate of that photosynthesis. 
So the first thing is that they have a large surface area and that allows them to absorb as much light as possible. The next thing is that they are thin and this allows for faster diffusion of gases both in and out of the leaf, what we call gas exchange. And the last adaptation is that they're made of cells containing many chloroplasts. Not all plant cells contain chloroplasts. For example, the cells in their roots don't because there's no light underground, so it would be a waste of time having uh, the chloroplasts. But the leaves in, so the, so the cells in leaves are absolutely jam packed with chloroplasts to allow as much photosynthesis as possible. Now, if you were to look at the underside of a leaf with a microscope, you would see millions and millions of these tiny little holes called stomata. Now, stomata or stoma for singular, stomata is plural, stoma is singular. So stomata are microscopic holes on the underside of leaves that allow for gas exchange. And this is all about what we need for photosynthesis. If you remember, our equation for photosynthesis is um, carbon dioxide plus water makes glucose plus oxygen. And so the stomata enable that gas exchange. So what happens is carbon dioxide can diffuse into the leaf to allow the carbon dioxide, uh, uh, allow the photosynthesis to take place. And also oxygen and water vapor will diffuse out. The oxygen that's diffusing out is the stuff that was produced by the photosynthesis. Now, in terms of the detail of the stomata, they are controlled by two cells that we call guard cells, and they're responsible for opening and closing the stomata. So during the daytime, the guard cells swell with water by osmosis. Um, in scientific terms, we say they become turgid, that means firm and rigid. Um, and that opens the stomata up and allows the gas exchange for photosynthesis to take place. So we can see that here. So we can see that these two sausage looking things, those are our guard cells. And we can see how they've got these um, vacuoles that are filled with water and that's opened up the stomata, creating this space here uh, to allow the um, carbon dioxide to diffuse in and the oxygen and water vapor to diffuse out. Now, at nighttime, what happens is the water leaves the guard cells by osmosis. You can see that here. Look how those vacuoles have got much less water in them than before. And that makes the guard cells floppy. The scientific word for that is flaccid. And this has the effect of closing the stomata. And that just prevents too much water loss. You know, we'll see later in the next video I do that we need water to be evaporating out of the leaves, but only during the daytime. At nighttime, it's just dangerous for the plant because it can lose too much water. So the stomata close up to prevent that water loss. OK, so now we're going to look at some of the different factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. We refer to these factors as limiting factors, and there are three of them that we need to know about. The first one is the carbon dioxide concentration. Then we've got the light intensity, which is a scientific way of saying the brightness of the light. And then we've got the temperature as well. So let's start by looking at how the carbon dioxide concentration affects the rate of photosynthesis. So if we were to graph carbon dioxide concentration versus the rate of photosynthesis, we get a graph that looks like this. Now we can explain this graph in two parts. So on the first part of the graph, increasing the CO2 concentration increases the number of particles, which increases the frequency of effective collisions. So that increases the rate of photosynthesis. And that's what we can see here. So in this first stage, where the graph has got this straight line passing through zero, what we call direct proportion, in this first section, the sloping section, we can say that carbon dioxide at this point is the limiting factor. The only way to increase the rate of photosynthesis at this point is to increase the concentration of carbon dioxide. However, at a certain point, the plant has more CO2 than it can use, so further increases make no difference. And that's what this flat section is here. On this flat section, we say that carbon dioxide is not the limiting factor. 
really important to note that at this point here, this flat section, the rate of photosynthesis is actually at its maximum. It has not stopped. The rate of photosynthesis is really high. It's just not getting any faster anymore. Now, our next limiting factor is the light intensity or the brightness of the light. Now, light supplies the energy to drive photosynthesis because it's an endothermic reaction. So increasing the light intensity increases the rate um, because there is more energy to drive that reaction forwards. And again, we get a very similar graph to our carbon dioxide one. So if we look at the light intensity on the x-axis and the rate on the y-axis, we can see that in the first part of the graph, we've again, we've got that directly proportional relationship where doubling the light intensity doubles the rate and so on. And we say at this point that light is the limiting factor. However, a bit like with carbon dioxide, at some point, the plant ends up having more light energy than it can use. So further increases make no difference. And that is what's happening on this section here where the graph has leveled out. And we say that light is no longer the limiting factor. Again, it's still worth noting that although the graph is leveled out, it's leveled out at the maximum rate of photosynthesis. So the photosynthesis has not stopped. It's just not getting any faster. Now, with temperature, our graph of temperature looks a little bit like this. Um, if we look at temperature on the x-axis and the rate on the y-axis, you can see that it goes up to begin with, a bit like with carbon dioxide concentration and light intensity, but then it goes down, which those other two graphs don't. So something a bit more complicated is happening here. So we'll explain that by looking first of all at the lower temperatures and then at the higher temperatures. Now at the lower temperatures, we're talking roughly between about zero and about 40 degrees Celsius. Um, initially, as the temperature increases, particles start to move faster. That's what we can see here. So the on this diagram, the blue is supposed to represent the enzymes that are um, controlling this reaction and the green is supposed to represent our substrate. Um, that's the, in this case, the carbon dioxide and the water molecules. So as we increase the temperature, the um, particles are initially moving slowly and then they move faster and faster and so on. Now, as those particles move faster, that increases the frequency of effective collisions. So the rate of reaction increases. And that's what we're seeing in that first part of the graph. So in that upward slope, that's where we can say that temperature in this case is a limiting factor. However, we've got that difficult bit to explain where the rate suddenly plummets once we get to really high temperatures. So what's going on there? So by high temperatures, we're talking roughly more than 40 degrees Celsius. It varies depending on where plants are from, but that's about the, the, the average kind of range. Now, what happens here is that as we get to these higher temperatures, the enzymes begin to denature. That means the active site, this square section here that has the complementary shape for the substrate, the active site begins to change shape. And we can see that happening here. So if we look there, that active site is starting to get slightly wiggly edges. And here, the active site is completely ruined. And so what happens is the rate starts to decrease because the substrate doesn't fit it. And eventually, it stops completely because the enzyme has been completely denatured. So that's why our graph plummets down, is to do with the fact that enzymes are getting denatured at those very high temperatures. So now we've seen what our three limiting factors are, we need to look at how they interact with each other. And this is higher tier material. Now, um, so to maximize the growth of their plants, um, we need to consider the balance of those three limiting factors. And this is something that farmers will do all the time. You know, if, if a farmer is growing um, some tomatoes or something in a greenhouse, they will really carefully try and control the balance of each of those three limiting factors to maximize the rate that their tomatoes grow. Um, so the rate of photosynthesis will be limited by whichever limiting factor is in the shortest supply. That's the kind of key thing here. So if we took the example of carbon dioxide concentration, once we get to the flat section here, adding more carbon dioxide doesn't increase the rate of photosynthesis. So what can the farmer do? The farmer can either increase the light intensity 
or they can increase the temperature. What about with light intensity? Well, again, at this flat section here, increasing the intensity no longer increases the rate of photosynthesis. So what can the farmer do? They can increase the carbon dioxide concentration or they can increase the temperature. And with temperature, you know, once you're at this peak, once you're at this optimum there where photosynthesis is already at the ideal temperature, what can the farmer do now? Well, they, they can increase the carbon dioxide concentration or they can increase the light intensity. So the key thing here is to figure out which things you already have enough of. So let's change one of the other two things instead. Now we're going to look at some higher tier material called the inverse square law, which will help us to understand the relationship between light intensity and the rate of photosynthesis. Now this is higher tier material, so if you're doing foundation tier, uh, just skip this next couple of slides. Now, so to start simply, the rate of photosynthesis is directly proportional to the light intensity. So that means that if we double the light intensity, we will double the rate. If we triple the light intensity, we will triple the rate and so on. Now, in terms of what affects the light intensity, as we move away from the source of a light, its intensity decreases and you will all have had this experience you may perhaps try to read in a room at night time um, and you might have had to move closer to a light in order to be able to get to where it's bright enough to read clearly now in terms of the exact decrease as we move away from the light it's described by this law called the inverse square law which says this it says that the intensity of light is proportional to one divided by the distance squared, okay? Or simply, I, intensity, is proportional to one over D squared. Now, so what this tells us is that, for example, if we double the distance, the light intensity becomes a quarter, because a quarter is one over four, and four is two squared. If we triple the distance, the intensity becomes a ninth, because, um, 1 over uh, 9 is 1 over 3 squared. But to understand that properly, we're going to take a little detour into a slightly strange seeming example at first, but it will make some sense once you follow it through. So let's imagine we had a little square, uh, uh, a little cube like that, and we wanted to paint it yellow. Okay. Now we're given exactly enough paint to just perfectly cover that 1 by 1 by 1 centimetre cube in our yellow paint. Now, the length of the sides here is one, and the area of that then is gonna be six, because there are six um, one centimeter cube, one centimeter squared sides, okay? And we're gonna call the color of this one. Now, let's imagine we had the same amount of paint, but and we had to use it to paint a cube that was double the size, okay? So this has now got a side of two. So its area, rather than being six is now 24 because we've got four centimeters squared on each side and there are six of those sides so its area is 24. So although we've doubled the um, uh, width of the cube, the area has gone up by a factor of four. So that means the same amount of paint has got to be spread over four times the area now so it will be as quarter as yellow. That's why this yellow is a fainter yellow. Let's try the same again with a cube with sides of three. Now, this time, my area, um, each, each face of my cube is now nine centimeters squared, and I've got six of those sides, so now my total area is 54. Okay, So I've got to spread my small amount of paint over a much bigger area. Now, my, although my side is now three times bigger, my area is now nine times bigger. So I'm spreading the same amount of paint over nine times more area. So it will end up being a ninth as yellow as it was. That is the inverse square law. If we apply this to some spheres, imagine that at the center of this sphere here, is where my light is radiating out. And as it hits the surface of that sphere, it will have a brightness of one. 
if I double the size of that sphere, okay, it's now going to be hitting an area four times bigger, so it will be a quarter of the intensity. And if my sphere is three times bigger, the surface area of that sphere will be nine times greater. And so the, the light is spread out over a nine times bigger area, so it becomes a ninth of what it was. Okay. Now, if all of that doesn't make sense to you, I think perhaps just looking at some calculations to see this in practice will. So let's look at some examples of the inverse square law and how it affects the rate of photosynthesis. So it's quite common in an exam to be given a table, something like this, where uh, column one is showing the distance from a lamp in centimetres. And then you've got some kind of units for the intensity of the light and some kind of other units for the rate of photosynthesis. And we've got to then just try and fill out the rest of this table. Now, you wouldn't have to fill out the whole table in the exam, but perhaps just one or two boxes of it. So starting at five, how do we calculate the light intensity um, when we are five centimetres away? So remember, our light intensity is proportional to one over the distance squared. So all we're going to do here our distance in this one is 5, so we're going to say our intensity is going to be 1 divided by 5 squared. Now, I've replaced my proportionality symbol with an equals symbol. That's fine because these are just relative units, um, so this math still works. So my intensity will be 1 divided by 5 squared, which is 1 divided by 25, which comes out to 0. 0.04. So I'm going to put 0 0.04 as my intensity there. What about the rate? Well, the rate is directly proportional to intensity. So all I need to do for my rate is just do the rate equals my original rate, 1000, multiplied by my new intensity, which was 0 0.4, or 0 0.04 rather, and that will give me a rate of 40. So my rate is 40, like that. Let's try the next one. What about when my distance is 10? Well, same thing. Intensity is proportional to 1 over the distance squared. So 1 over my distance is 10. So it would be 1 over 10 squared. That is 1 over 100, which equals 0 0.01. So my new intensity is 0 0.01. Now, what about the rate? Well, the rate is directly proportional to the intensity. So my intensity started out at 1, now it's 0 0.01. So if I just do my original rate of 1,000, multiplied by my new intensity, 0 0.01, I will get an answer of 10. doesn't matter what the units are because the units are arbitrary. That just means no particular units. Um, and so I can put 10 as my new rate. Let's try, do two more. We'll try 15 first of all. So now my distance is 15. I'm going to say the intensity equals 1 over the distance, so 1 over 15 squared, which is 1 over 15 squared is 225. And 1 over 225, if I put that into a calculator, comes out to 0 0.0044. So that's my new intensity here. That is rounded a little bit. Um, and so for my rate, I'm going to do the rate equals my initial rate of 1,000 multiplied by my new intensity of 0 0.0044. Um, and that gives me a new intensity of 4.4. Um, uh, sorry, a new rate of 4.4, rather. So put that there. And my final one, my distance now is going to be 20. So my intensity, hopefully you're spotting the pattern now, 1 over the distance squared. So 1 divided by the distance, which was 20, squared. 1 over 20 is, um, so uh, 20 squared rather, is 400. So this becomes 1 over 400. And that equals 0 0.0025. So I can put that in my final uh, cell here. And then finally, to get my last rate, 
again, I'm going to start with my initial rate, which was a thousand, and then multiply it by the 0 0.0025, and that is going to give me a final rate of 2.5, just like that. So that's how the inverse square law works. And um, all we're going to do is do one divided by our distance squared. That's the key calculation that we want to do. So now we're going to look at the core practical for the photosynthesis unit. Um, there are actually two versions of this. So we're going to look at the algae balls version first. Um, now, this is the actual um, method that is used in the um, Edexcel core practical worksheet for this. But there is another version as well, which we'll look at later. Um, now, the aim of this experiment is to investigate how light intensity affects the rate of photosynthesis in algae balls. And you can see an algae ball there. All it is is this little jelly ball that's got lots of algae cells mixed up in it. Um, algae is just like a little single celled plant. And we can use this as a very controllable way to study the rate of photosynthesis. Now, in terms of our method, our first step is to set up a lamp, a meter ruler, and a beaker of water like this. Now that beaker of water is there as a heat filter. So the idea is that all the heat being given out by that lamp will be absorbed by that water so that um, it's only the light intensity that's uh, changing in the experiment, not also the temperature. The next thing we do is we get 10 of our algae balls and we place them in six vials, that six little containers, and we fill each of those with the same volume of hydrogen carbonate indicator. The hydrogen carbonate indicator is an indicator that will tell us about the CO2 concentration um, present in our uh, uh, solution. And so here you can see there is our um, vial containing those 10 algae balls. And it starts out at a pH of 8.4 as you can see matched on that color chart there and hopefully that pH will change as the carbon dioxide is used up by photosynthesis as we go through the experiment. Now what we do then is we place five of those vials at different measured distances away from the lamp so kind of 10 to 50 centimeters like this one at 10, 20, 30, 40 and 50 centimeters and so on and then also we get our final vial and we wrap it in foil to block the light. So you can see here that foil around the outside of that vial. That's there to completely block the light so that hopefully no photosynthesis at all takes place. And that acts as our control that we can compare our um, results to. So what we do then once everything's set up is we wait for about 60 minutes for a significant amount of photosynthesis to take place and then after that 60 minutes, we compare the color of each of our vials against the indicator chart and we record the pH. And we can see that the colors of each of these have changed now. So the control one has stayed as it was at pH 8.4. But if we look at the color of the one closest to the light, it's now got pH of 9.2. The next one, a bit further away, is pH of 9. Um, 8.8, 8.6, and the one that's furthest away was also 8.4. So basically no photosynthesis happened there either. So what we can see is that the colour change is telling us how much photosynthesis has taken place because it's telling us how the pH has changed. So doing this experiment gives us a results table that looks something like this, where we've got the distance from the lamp in centimetres, we've got the starting pH, and we've got the final pH. And now we need to try and analyze the results of this. So the first step is to calculate the pH change by subtracting the, um, uh, and, uh, the starting pH away from the final pH. And if we do that, for the first one, we do 9.2, take away 8.4, which gives us plus 0.8. Then for the 20 centimeter one, we do 9, take away 8.4, which gives us plus 0.6. Um, for the 30 centimeter one, 8.8 .8, take 8.4, we get plus 0.4. Um, next is 8.6 take 8.4, which gives us plus 0.2. And the both the 50 one and the control one haven't changed at all, so their change is just 0.0, .0 like that. 
Okay. Next, then, we draw a scatter graph of our results with a line of best fit. And so you can see we've got the distance from the lamp in centimetres on the x-axis, the pH change on the y-axis, and we can see that our results fall into this nice straight line pattern like that. So now we need to try and draw a conclusion. So what can we conclude? We can conclude that the lower the distance from the lamp, the greater the pH change. We can see that really clearly. The greatest pH change was when the um, vial was closest to the lamp and the smallest pH change was when it was furthest from the lamp. So what does this tell us? So a greater pH change means that more carbon dioxide is used up, which means that there is a higher rate of photosynthesis. So decreasing the distance increases the intensity. So therefore, what this means is that increasing the intensity increases the rate of photosynthesis. Now, in terms of improvements to this experiment, um, the main improvement is um, measuring any pH with an indicator is always inaccurate because it's very difficult to accurately compare the colours. And so a better way to, uh, to measure this would be to measure the pH with a pH meter which is a little digital probe that gives a very accurate decimal point um, uh, reading of the exact pH, and this gives you more accurate measurements. Now, the second version of this tool practical involves using pondweed to monitor the photosynthesis. Now, most schools actually tend to do this one uh, in practice because the algae ball ones, most people just find it doesn't really work very well. And so you get a better experience in class if we use pondweed. So the aim of this one is to investigate how light intensity affects the rate of photosynthesis of pondweed. Now, in terms of our method, the setup starts off similar to the algae balls one. So we set up a lamp, a meter ruler and an empty beater of water again to act as our heat filter to make sure that it's only the light intensity that is changing each time, not the temperature as well. Now, what we then do is we place a length of pondweed in a beaker of water containing some sodium hydrogen carbonate. Not hydrogen carbonate indicator, just sodium hydrogen carbonate. And what that's there to do is to replace the carbon dioxide in the water as it gets used up by photosynthesis, just to make sure the carbon dioxide concentration stays fairly constant. Now, we place that at a specific distance away from the uh, from the lamp and what we do is we try and count the number of oxygen bubbles that we see in three minutes so if you look very closely um, you'll find one part of the plant that is producing a steady stream of bubbles like that and what we want to do is try and count those bubbles because hopefully because those bubbles are oxygen and so the more quickly those bubbles are being produced means the more quickly photosynthesis is taking place. And then we just repeat this at different distances from the lamp and hopefully we should see we should see some variation in the number of bubbles. It's a bit unpredictable, it's a bit fiddly this one, but it is more reliable than the algae balls one. Most people do find they can get this experiment to work in the lab. Okay, so once we've done our um, pondweed core practical, we get results that look like this, where we've got the distance from the lamp in centimetres and the number of bubbles in three minutes uh, there as well. Now, in terms of analysis, there are a couple of things to do. The first thing is to calculate the light intensity, which is one divided by the distance squared. So for 10 centimetres, it's one over 10 squared, which comes to um, 0 0.01. For 20 centimetres, it's 1 over 20 squared, which is 0 0.0025. Then we have 1 over 30 squared, which comes out to 0 0.0011. Um, then we have 1 over 40 squared, which is 0 0.00625. Um, uh, and then we have 1 over 50 squared, which comes to um, uh, 0.0004. Now, if you're not doing higher tier, don't worry about those calculations. You would not be expected to do that in an exam, but um, higher tier students could be 
and uh, we saw that on the inverse square law slide. Now, the second thing that anyone might be able to, uh, expect to do is to calculate the rate um, in terms of bubbles per minute. And to, so to calculate that, all we do is the number of bubbles in one minute divided by three. So the first one will be 201 divided by three, um, which gives us uh, 67 bubbles per minute. Then uh, the second one would be uh, 48 divided by three, which is 16 bubbles per minute. Then we'll do 21 divided by three, which is seven bubbles per minute. Then we'll do 12 divided by three, which gives us four bubbles per minute. And finally, we'll do uh, six divided by three to give us two bubbles per minute. Okay, now the last bit of analysis will be to draw a scatter graph of those results with the light intensity on the x-axis and the, the rate of photosynthesis in bubbles per minute on the y-axis. And if we do that, we get a graph that looks like this. And we can see how all the results are falling along this nice straight line that's pretty much going to go, if we trace it back, it's pretty much going to go through the origin. So we can describe that as directly proportional. So what can our conclusion be here? So our conclusion is going to be that, first of all, increasing the light intensity increases the rate of photosynthesis. We can see that very clearly. We can then describe that the relationship is directly proportional. That's a straight line passing through zero, zero. And that's it. That is our conclusion done. The last thing to do is to think about some improvements. So in terms of improvements, the main improvement is that counting bubbles of gas is not an accurate measure of the amount of photosynthesis that's taken place. So a better way is to collect the gas in a gas syringe to accurately measure the um, rate of oxygen production. The downside of that is that the volumes are very low. So in order to collect an appreciable amount uh, of oxygen, you actually have to run this for a long time and certainly longer than is practical uh, in a school science lab. Okay, so that's it. The end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.